First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Todd Halverson and the partnership program that um, brings such distinguished uh, journalists, not only distinguished journalists, but distinguished working journalists to campus. Uh, uh, Ms. Boomiller is, is, I'm assuming, working on some deadlines and projects even as we speak. I, I took the liberty of printing out some of her most recent stories, and there's quite a, a lengthy list on Time's topic, so I'd encourage you to go and, and review some of her most recent stories focusing on uh, the situation in Egypt. Um, Elizabeth Boomiller is a Pentagon correspondent in the Washington Bureau of the New York Times. In 2008, she covered the presidential campaign of Senator John McCain. Previously, from 2001 to 2006, she was a Times House White House correspondent and also wrote a weekly column, White House Letter, about the people and behind the scenes events of the presidency. She was the Times City Hall Bureau chief from 1999 to 2001, where she covered Mayor Rudolph Giuliani and his Senate race against Hillary Rodham Clinton. Prior to that, she worked on the Times Metropolitan staff in New York as a general assignment reporter and as one of the writers on the Public Lives column. She's also written for the New York Times Magazine and the newspaper's culture and travel pages. From 1979 to 1985, she worked for the Washington Post in Washington, New Delhi, Tokyo, and New York. Her first job in journalism was in the Naples Bureau of the Miami Herald. Her most recent book, Condoleezza Rice and American Life, which will have special resonance considering our, our lecture this semester from Secretary Rice, was based on extensive interviews with the Secretary of State and uh, over 150 others, and was published in 2007 by Random House. Uh, her previous books include May You Be the Mother of a Hundred Sons, A Journey Among the Women of India, The Secret of Secrets of Mariko, A Year in the Life of a Japanese Woman and Her Family. In 2006 and 2007, she was a public policy scholar at the Woodrow Wilson Insti uh, International Center and a transatlantic fellow at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. Uh, Ms. Boomler was born in 1956 in Alberg, Denmark, and grew up in Cincinnati, Ohio. She graduated from the Medill School of Journalism at Northwestern University and the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia University. From 1995 to 2001, she was the leader of Girl Scout Troop 1511 in Bronxville, New York. She now lives in Washington, D.C., uh, in the area, Washington, D.C. area, with her husband, Stephen R. Wiseman, and their two children. Her topic today, the rise of China, what it means to the United States. Please join me in welcoming Elizabeth Boomiller. Uh, thank you, Corey, and uh, thank you to the Kennedy Center, and thank you to uh, Brigham Young University. It's a beautiful campus. I've never been here before. And um, I've already uh, enjoyed a number of conversations with the students who are extremely international. Maybe it's a self-selecting group who has turned out today, but um, I'm very impressed with what you know about the world. And I also just want to thank you. Not many people mentioned my years as a Girl Scout leader. I have to tell you, I sometimes tell people, there's 20 girls. Those girls are all in college now, very good schools, um, many of them. And um, I tell people sometimes that that's probably the my biggest contribution to the world, actually, was leading that Girl Scout troop for six years, and um, maybe beyond what I've done with the New York Times and the Washington Post. But um, anyway, thank you for mentioning it. Um, um, I'm here to talk about China, and particularly the um, I should be the uh, talk. I should have titled it the talk, uh, the rise of the Chinese military, which is what I'm covering these days. Um, but I'd like to start just by telling you a little bit about my job in covering the Pentagon. Um, I know some of, no, I don't think there's too much over, overlap. There was, some of you heard this earlier this morning when I spoke to a journalism class, but I just think it helps an audience place what I do because it's kind of mysterious sometimes what journalists do. Um, I have no background in the military myself. My father and my stepfather were in the Second World War, um, but um, beyond that, there was no, uh, there's no background in the military in my family. But it was really in the course of covering uh, the White House right after the 9-11 attacks. My first day on the White House beat was September 10th, 2001. I often tell people that. And, and for the next five years, that you know, it, there was not a dull moment. Um, and in the, but in the course of those years, I went to an awful lot of military bases with the president, who was, after all, the commander in chief. And, and I saw on, on there and overseas really how broad and deep the military's reach really is in this country. And so after covering John McCain's uh, presidential campaign, he is, after all, a former Navy pilot, I put up my hand to cover the Pentagon. Um, the United States, as you know, I'm sure, has the most powerful military the world has 
ever known, and the annual budget is now approaching $700 billion. That includes the cost of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. That's a budget that's obviously close to a trillion dollars. It's, it's where the United States spends an awful lot of its money. Um, and it has some 1 million, 1.4 million forces on active duty, some 2.4 million personnel overall. There's no other military that comes close to the United States in, in, in terms of size and scope. And so I th this seemed uh, something interesting that ought to be covered. I should know more about I should I wanted to write about it. Um, and so for the past two years, I've been one of the times as two White House Pentagon correspondents uh, working alongside uh, Tom Shanker, who has been there a lot longer than I has. We have. He's been there close to 10 years. Um, I'm based in Washington, as you heard. Um, my family and I live in the Washington suburbs. And as part of my job, I go to the Pentagon a lot. I go to press briefings there. I go to um, background briefings. I go to um, hearings on Capitol Hill about the military budget and about when General Petraeus comes to town. I go to uh, his, the briefings he does to Congress. Um, I go to talk to people at various military think tanks around town. I also go on trips to Afghanistan, to Pakistan, to India, the DMZ between North and South Korea, Israel, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Oman, Abu Dhabi, that's just to name those in the last year. Really anywhere the U.S. has vital for has, has forces in vital interests. I've spent the night on an aircraft carrier off the coast of Pakistan. And in the last year, as I was telling some of you earlier, I've spent an, a lot of time embedded with um, Marines in Helmand province in southern Afghanistan. It was part of a series I did on uh, what are called female engagement teams. It's the military's name for uh, women Marines, female Marines who um, who who, um, who join infantry patrols in Helmand and uh, try, in the course of these patrols, try to reach out to Afghan women and try and win them over to the U.S. side. It's part of the General Petraeus' counterinsurgency strategy. It's um, it's very difficult, dangerous, but very interesting work. Um, and so I did. I spent a lot of time in Afghanistan this past year. Um, the idea is that you can't um, you can't win over the population if you only talk to half of it. So, and th the cultural prohibitions in Afghanistan are such that um, American uh, male troops and Marines cannot, you know, uh, go into a home with an Afghan woman, can't speak to her, talk to her. So this was an attempt for the military to try and again reach out to 50 percent of the Afghan population. Um, in this country, I've written a lot of, in this past year about the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. I've also written about some about WikiLeaks, about Bradley Manning, who is the uh, young Army private who is accused of, of, of leaking. Um, and I've also e even written about the military's number one expense, which is not a sophisticated weapon system, but the cost of health care for its personnel, for TRICARE. And that's a big uh, debate right now in Washington because the, the most recent pen, uh, uh, Robert Gates, the defense secretary, has just proposed cuts to TRICARE. It's, been, it's a big political um, football in Washington right now. Yesterday, I was, I as you heard, I've been reading, writing about the Egyptian military. I'll explain sort of why later. And yesterday, I was helping out uh, from Washington on the story that was in the Times this morning on the four Americans who were killed by pirates off the coast of Somalia and, uh, and what happened to the Navy SEALs who tried to rescue them. Which now brings me to my topic, the rise of China. As you probably can tell from my background, I'm not a China expert, so <laughs> but I am, but I I I, I do uh, know something now about the Chinese military and about the Amer and especially about the American military's reaction to this, to the rise of the Chinese military. I'm going to tell you um, the I'm going to talk about this in the context of a trip I took last month to Beijing with the Defense Secretary. Um, the visit was actually a precursor, which uh, to a trip the following week by the Chinese president to the White House, um, which I, you probably read about it, got a lot of attention. The specific goal of Gates's trip was to try to smooth over one of the rockiest parts of the U.S.-China relationship, which is um, the state of affairs between the Chinese American and militaries. And this was not an easy task. Um, uh, and, and as it turned out, this trip, unlike many of the trips I've been on with the president and other government officials, was tumultuous, unscripted, full of embarrassment and intrigue, and in other words, you know, a good mix for a journalist, not perhaps for U.S.-China relations, but for those of us covering it, this never happens, you know, that something goes wrong on a trip. They're always exactly as their, the agenda is set out. Um, the story of the trip actually began a few days before Gates took off when China rolled out a very pointed welcome for him, which was the first public display of the J-20, its, uh, its first radar-evading stealth fighter jet. You know, after years of top secret development, 
The jet, which bore a striking resemblance to the Pentagon's own stealth fighter, the F-22 Raptor, was out in the open on um, a runway in southwest China where people were taking pictures of it. The Wall Street Journal did a, did, did a big display of the, of the jet on page one of its, um, of its one of its editions. Um, Chinese military and analysts were saying this was not at all an accident, that the Chinese, they said, wanted to show off to Gates, to show off, you know, flex their muscles ahead of the trip, show him, you know, that who was boss, sort of. Um, anyway, so this was the setup for the trip. So we get on board um, Gates is planning to leave for China, and I should just tell you here, there's some journalism students here, so bear with me. People will say, so you accompanied Gates to China. Why well, so I explain to you what this is like? Um, there, it's not quite like traveling with the president. There's a fewer, a smaller press corps. There's about 15 reporters. There's room for 15 reporters on Gates's plane. It's a, um, it's, uh, it looks like Air Force One on the outside. It's a big 747 with the United States of America painted against the side. But it's called, um, unofficially, the doomsday plane. It's the plane that... Uh, the president is supposed to um, board should there be a nuclear attack, and because of the equipment aboard, he can run the country from the air. Um, inside it, it's not nearly as exotic looking as it sounds. It's There's a huge section in the back, which is, is uh, old computer, I mean, it's computer equipment. It looks very antiquated, but there's, I, I assume it's up to date. <laughs> there's a lot of people running it. And Gates has a cabin and a conference room up front, and then there's a, in the middle section, there's a, a cramped middle section, sort of business class seating for about 15 reporters, and that's how we fly. And so uh, the good news is, is that it's, you know, because we're on the, on the Gates's plane, we have some access to him, and we can, there's a, there's, it's a, you know, he talks to us. So in that day, on that trip, Gates came back to the press cabin for a mini press conference, as he usually does, and we naturally asked him about the plane, and he said, well, you know, he had seen pictures of it, of course, but he was very dismissive and said he wasn't sure how stealthy it really was. Um, and, you know, he was uh, so much for the uh, Chinese, um, you know, and their, their, their new proud plane. Um, but he did say, and here he was reflecting, rising worries at the Pentagon, that he was concerned about the Chinese military buildup in the Pacific, where the Chinese are more and more challenging the U.S. Navy, as well as other navies in the in region, like South Korea and Japan. Um, there, you know, China, there, there's a, I can just go quickly through this, because this gets into sort of weapons technology, but besides the Che-20, which is a jet that can carry missiles, can refuel in midair, and is designed to fly far beyond China's borders, the Chinese are also thought to be close to developing what's called an anti-ship ballistic missile, or a carrier killer in the common terminology, that has the potential to strike the enormous aircraft carriers that are at the, that are at the heart of the American naval presence in the Pacific. Um, the Chinese are also on their way to building their own aircraft carriers and could launch several by 2020. They're, moderni they're modernizing a 60-boat submarine fleet which is already the largest in Asia, uh, with super quiet nuclear subs and second generation subs that are equipped with missiles. Now, China says, and they said during the trip, that the military buildup is peaceful, um, which is what the Chinese defense minister said during a press conference the first day of the trip in Beijing, by the time we got there. He also said that certain people were, um, th that is the United States, he didn't, were making far too much of China's military buildup. And as official joint press conferences go, where there's just platitudes exchanged, this was a fairly brusque statement to make about the United States. Um, the next day, Gates was meeting with the Chinese president, and I was on the way to cover the start of the meeting at the Great Hall of the People when I got an email from my colleague, um, Michael Wines, who's the Beijing bureau chief of the Times, uh, who told me that there had just been a test flight of the J-20 an hour before Gates was to visit with the Chinese president. Now, I can't emphasize enough. I know this sounds like, what's the big deal? What a huge international deal this was for the Chinese military to do this when Gates is over in Beijing trying to smooth over military relations. He's trying to make, the Chinese are trying to make nice, and all of a sudden they do this, this in-your-face show of force right before the meeting. Um, for the, again, for the reporters, this was, this was a, <laughs> <laughs> good development for us. We had a we had a really serious news story on our hands, um, and um, you know it was on page one the next day in most newspapers. But um, amazingly enough, even more amazing than that, afterward, Gates told us he did a briefing when we came back. Uh, he came back from the meeting and did a briefing with the Pentagon reporters at the hotel, and he told us that um, he had asked who about President Hu of China. He'd asked who about this 
test flight the minute he w in, during this meeting, this 20 minute meeting, and who assured him he said that he knew that this had nothing to do with Gates's visit. But what was even more surprising was that two Pentagon officials later told us, and then Gates confirmed the next day, that who had known nothing about the test, which was a stunner uh, for those of those of you and us who follow these kind of um, international relations. Because what that said was, was that the Chinese military had acted without telling the president. And it was, in, it just gave an indication of a Chinese military that was a little bit out of control, which was playing into the worst fears of the Pentagon, some in Congress. Um, you know, so the military was not only acting on its own, challenging the American defense secretary, it was challenging its own president ahead of, you know, right in the middle of this very hope, high profile visit. What's important to know here is that who was not popular with Chinese military, with the Chinese military, and they were unhappy that he had asked them ahead of his visit with the White House to uh, to try and smooth over relations uh, with the military so that things would go better in Washington. And um, you know, who who was in his last um, months as president was you know eager to make this White House trip a success. Now. The next, so this was a huge story. We wrote big, you know, I wrote stories. I was up all night writing a story about it uh, with, with Michael Wines, the Beijing bureau chief. Um, and, uh, the, but the next day, interesting enough, Gates, um, the next day, China's official state-run media said that the test was really just a coincidence. It had nothing to do with Gates' visit. And nobody really believed that, but there were some at the Pentagon. And Gates kind of later said he thought it was possible that the test was, um, more a symptom of perhaps um, just bureaucratic dysfunction of the right hand not knowing what the left hand is doing. The test, you know, was conducted by scientists who were, you know, in the southern part of China who were focused more on technology and propulsion than they were on politics and, you know, the visit. And um, they had tried, I think they had tried to test the jet earlier, but they had been prevented from doing it because of weather. So it is possible, they held out, you know, Gates and some other people held out the possibility that it was, that, you know, they had maybe just, it had been a, just a mix up. Um, and, you know, Pentagon officials do point out that there is plenty of evidence that of, of this in our system as well. Um, and I'm just, because we were talking about Condoleezza kind of Rice earlier, there is an incident I thought of from my, um, it's in my book about her, which comes in, in February 2001. It was, Bush was the new president and, um, he was on his first foreign trip uh, to, to Mexico to meet with then President Fox of Mexico. And they were uh, all in this big important meeting with Fox and the Mexican delegation on one side and Bush and the American delegation on the other side. And Ari Fleischer, who was then the White House press secretary, came in and handed a little note to Cond Condoleezza Rice. And it said, and this, I guess, this was a, from her, an interview I had with her, and the note said to her, why are we bombing Baghdad? And um, and uh, she looked at it and said, "What?" You know, and excused herself from the room and asked, "said Why are we doing what?" And it turned and so she left the room. And it turned out that um, some days earlier, this was during the days of the no-fly zone before the uh, American invasion, that um, the uh, military had informed the White House that they were going to do some bombing of uh, command and control sites and radar sites in Iraq. Uh, one of them was unusually close to Baghdad. It was on the outskirts of Baghdad. And it was just that, the, as, as Condoleezza Rice explained it to me, that they weren't as aware of how extensive the bombing would be. So this does occur in our country, but it's not supposed to happen. The commander in chief is this is, we have a civilian led military, civilian run military. This is not, the military is not supposed to be doing this on its own. But, but back to China with two questions. Um, what is the real reason for the buildup, and how concerned should the U.S. be, the uh, military buildup? There, in both cases, there's divided opinion. You're not going to get me, I'm a reporter, I'm not going to say, you know, <laughs> take a side here. But um, in the first case, China, as you've heard, insists that its buildup is peaceful and that it, it is aimed at enforcing its claims in the Pacific, particularly Taiwan. You know, should leaders there seek legal independence from the mainland? Um, and right now, I know some of you in here have been to, on missions to Taiwan, correct? But right now, of course, Ta Taiwan is governed separately but still claimed by China as part of its sovereign territory. Um, and that status of Taiwan is maimed in large part by an American commitment to defend Taiwan should Beijing carry out an attack. Um, but American officials in the Pentagon says that, that, that China's buildup is much more targeted at limiting America's ability 
project to project military power in this in the Western Pacific. Hence, their anti ballistic anti ship ballistic missile that could hit an aircraft carrier. Um, so, how concerned should the, should the U.S. be? Um, again, there's a division. Um, not long ago, uh, Admiral Mike Mullen, who's the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, who's America's highest ranking military official, spoke of what he called heavy investments in sea and air capabilities in ch by China and said he saw a wide gap between China's military program and its stated intentions. In a comment that's been widely quoted, he's, he said that he had moved from being genuinely curious to being genuinely, cons genuinely concerned. Um, and Gates himself, in the press conference aboard his plane, said that the Chinese, and he said this somewhat more privately too, that the Chinese clearly have the potential to put some of our capabilities at risk and that we have to pay attention to them. So as a result, the U.S. has been stepping up investments in a lot of, in a range of weapons from jet fighters to, to other kinds of technology as a counterweight to China, specifically an investment in a new long-range bomber, as well as a new, I mean, this is on the outside of my knowledge here, as, a, as well as a new generation of electronic jammers for the Navy that are designed to thwart a missile from hitting its target. Um, you know, but other, but other officials say that the, the threat from China is, is overblown and that, that um, the U.S. should not overestimate China's military prowess, and they point to our, the way we overestimated the Soviet Union for so many years during the Cold War. And that China, they say, has not yet demonstrated an ability to use its weapons, um, its different weapon systems in proficient warfare, what's called joint war war for war joint warfare. And the words of a the Navy's top intelligence officer who did an interview recently, he said, "Have you seen them deploy large groups of naval forces? No. Have we seen large joint sophisticated exercises? No. Do they have any combat proficiency? No." And other defense officials who I just spoke to last week say that, look, China is still a generation or two behind the U.S. militarily. And that is assuming that the U.S. itself does not advance militarily over the next 20 or 40 years, which is an unlikely scenario. But for now, there is a real worry at the Pentagon that there might be some sort of an, uh, an incident or an event in the Pacific uh, that would escalate into a wider conflict and draw in the U.S. I mean, Chinese, Chinese fishing boats have you know have clashed with Japanese and South Korean Coast Guard cutters recently in recent years near disputed islands and there's a you know and there's a growing concern that China um, and U.S. naval ships who are operating in fairly close proximity in the same waters could become involved in some kind of an incident. Um, but to conclude, and I want to talk about um, after the trip, Gates amazingly enough declared declared it as a su success. The Chinese, the takeaway from the visit is what, is to use the terminology of the State Department and the Pentagon, the takeaway was that the Chinese agreed to reopen uh, military talks and exchanges with the United States, with the U.S. military. They, they are, they, these talks have been constantly suspended by the Chinese every time there's a new arms sale announced to Taiwan. Um, and so there's hope that this now, this there, there will be now you know, continued talks. I mean, they agreed to talk. To, they, they, they ended up agreeing to talk in more talks. Um, and so that was considered a sign of some modest progress. But when I checked last week with the Pentagon people who, who, who uh, handle these policies, they said, well, they had, I said, how's it going? Are the Chinese going to be coming anytime soon to the United States for talks? They said, well, we're working on it. We haven't heard a lot back from them. We're working on it. So there, I mean, there's a story I have to write at some point saying that either nothing has happened or something has happened or something very modest has happened. So there's not, um, there hasn't been a huge amount of, of movement forward. Um, I would also just say too, uh, I, I have what, about half an hour, I wanted to leave about half an hour, 25 minutes for questions. I would also say that I'm happy to entertain questions about some of the other things I've been doing in, in, in covering the Pentagon the last two years, particularly about Afghanistan. Um, I've been there in the, a lot. I've been there probably five or six times in the past year. I was just there in December. I'm going again next month, and um, happy to talk about how um, how that is shaping up to the extent that anybody can really know. Um, the big um, the the next big event in for the United for the White House is of course July 2011, when Obama has vowed to start withdrawing some troops from Afghanistan. Af and but but it's really hard to know. How many? They don't. I don't think the military yet knows how many there will be, and whether, 
w the difference between what the White House wants withdrawn and what the Pentagon wants withdrawn, what that difference will be. And it's also really hard to know right now to what extent the U.S. is um, successful in Afghanistan. Um, there's a bit of a lull right now because it's the winter, but that what is called the spring fighting season is about to begin. And the big question on the minds of U.S. officials is whether the Taliban, which took a serious beating um, in the fall from a stepped-up military campaign, it, it will be able to reconstitute itself and find fresh recruits. Um, there was a story just a couple of days ago uh, by Carlotta Gall out of Afghanistan quoting Taliban commanders saying that they were demoralized, that they were upset with uh, the, the senior leadership across the border in, in, Af in uh, Pakistan, that they were sending them across the border to die, and they weren't, you know, so this is the military's been picking up conversations like this for some time, but the question is nobody really knows until the spring. Of course, I have to also have a caveat here that the U.S. has been saying that for years, that we will wait to see what happens in the spring, and then it's 10 years we're been at, we've been at war, so I don't really know. But it's going to be an interesting uh, summer. Um, and also there's talk that General Petraeus is getting, will be leaving at some point, so the question is who takes over after him. And the other event, of course, is that um, uh, Robert Gates is leaving as Defense Secretary. He says sometime this year, so that's another big question of what happens. So there's a lot happening on my beat. Um, I'm happy to take any and all questions. Um, thank you very much. You've, you're, um, I've, it's been a great, so far it's been a great trip. Really enjoy uh, talking, to, talking to many of you. Thanks. My name is Adam Jacobs, and I'm studying political science. And I know in the in Afghanistan they're negotiating about a permanent U.S. presence there with the bases. What is the region's reaction to that, specifically Pakistan? With oh the permanent well, U.S. bases. Permanent U.S. bases. They're yeah. they're negotiating more. Um, well, uh, I don't think there'd be politically there'd be a a, a lot of. Um, support for permanent U.S. I mean, right now, there's, uh, the negotiations right now are really about um, uh, reintegrating Taliban and and having them, you know, to what extent the gov they will come back into the fold of the government, you know. Um, and so, but those are kind of, they're not going really quickly. Um, I mean, right now, I mean, there, there are stories about them happening, but, uh, n there's nothing major that's occurred. There hasn't been this wholesale, you know, switch from the Taliban over to, to the government side. Um, that is the strategy. That's the hope that the Taliban will take enough of a beating that they will, and the morale will be so low that they will, they will be reintegrated, um, and become part in some form part of the government. Um, in terms of basis, I'm not um, sure. There are. I mean, I think. There's Bagram. There's a lot. There's there's Leatherneck in the south. There's Bagram up near near Kabul. There are a number of bases. I don't know um, if there. I actually am not familiar if there are of, of, of ongoing negotiations now about whether those bases will stay. I assume they'll be there for for some time. I mean, we're now looking at 2014 for when uh, you know the White House has kind of moved the date and the Pentagon has moved the 2011 date now to 2014 is the date that the U.S. turned over combat operations to the Afghans themselves, similar to what has occurred in Iraq. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, here. My name is Chandler Grigg. I'm studying political science in Chinese. I know there's a massive campaign to win over the hearts and minds of the Afghani people, and I was wondering your opinion on how well that's going <laughs> and how much progress we'll be able to make by 2014. Oh, boy. If any, somebody knew the answer to that question. Um, I, uh, I, I can tell you my personal experience. I mean, I think it's sort of interesting. Um, you know, when I was traveling with, with, when I was on the foot patrols with the women, with the Marine, you know, with the Marines, um, it's, it's, it's possible. It's certainly possible. I mean, I've seen it happen in some parts of Helmand Province, but it is really, really slow, and it is extremely labor intensive, and it is, uh, uh, it requires just a lot of money, a lot of people, and a lot of time. 
Um, you know, you, for example, in September I was in uh, in uh, sort of the far flung outskirts of Marja, which was the site of a major military campaign in a year ago, actually. And it's now Marja is not uh, under control, but it's a lot quieter than it was. Um, and so we were walking. I was on a patrol with um, a group of Marines. It was about it was about five women. It was three Marines and me. It was six women. It was three Marines, uh, me, the photographer, and the interpreter, who was also Afghan American. And so, you know, you go. At we that was then the the men, the male Marines would. We were all with them, and they would wait outside when we went into a, a woman's home. You know, into a compound. Then you go inside, and you take. You well, no, we don't take our shoes off. They, they don't take your boots off. They would, but um, the, but we would go inside. They would serve us tea, and you'd sit down, and they would start talking. This was in this case. This was one case where this was the first time they had been to this village. You know, so it was going in cold, and hello, we're you know we just sort of early chit chat about how many kids do you have? What does your husband do? Uh, where is your husband now? I mean, the suspicion was the husband was either a Taliban or or sympathetic to the Taliban because the Taliban controlled much of the area. And you know it was uh, so that you know, and you say space, say spend half an hour there drinking tea and making chit chat, and then the idea is you go back, and you know they they took the Marines would take off their assault rifles, and you know take their helmets off, and it was a big, you know, operation. It was sitting down and talking to like three women, right, and. Uh, so that went on all day, and that was in the course of a day. The women, the Marines, women visited about six homes, maybe, and some of the Afghan women were receptive. Others were frightened and said, "Go!" I mean, you can imagine th these, you know, <laughs> these these three these military people come to your door with you know with with the vests and the helmets and the, you know, and the rifles on, and you know, let you in. But so that took all day. That was like six visits, okay? And the idea was that then they would continue those visits and build on that relationship and start working with the women to um, to uh, build a school in the area or to you know bring a health clinic to the area or just to build a bridge or you know to get the well working again. I mean, that's see how slow that is. Now there are parts of where I was in Helmand, where um, near closer to Lashkar Gah, the capital. Um, uh, there's a couple of big success stories. There's one, as you may have read about, called Nawa, and there's um, others uh, near Garmsh. These are probably don't mean, any mean anything to you, but there's other parts where the Marines went in, say, in the summer of 2008, 2009, and they'd been there a long time. And, you know, things had been, they'd either killed all the Taliban or they had employed them in, in, in you know, by, you know, mine clearing programs, so they were getting a wage now from the, from the, Afghan government or the U.S. military, you know, or they'd chase them away. And so there are parts of Helmand where you can go and things are fairly stable, you know, but the question is how that's taken years and it's a big country, <laughs> you know, and meanwhile other parts of Afghanistan have become more unstable as the, f as the U.S. has focused its forces in the south. The big push now has been in, Ka in Kandahar, the other province right next to Helmand. That's, that's basically an army operation. They're doing much the same thing. So my answer is I don't know. I mean, I, th I the answer is I to see this up fr uh, up close is really a, one of the great to see how this works. After I said this earlier, after covering all the policy debate in Washington about it, to see it on the literally on the ground, <laughs> up close like that, you know, living in these remote patrol bases with the Marines and watching how it happens is really one of the great privileges of my job. As fearful as frightening as, as you know, it's 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 not relaxing. I'll tell you, it's not especially safe all the time but it um uh you know so yeah it, it's it, theoretically it's possible it's just i don't know about what the pentagon um says is we don't know if the american people will have the patience to or congress will have the patience to keep at this we've been at it for a decade and and again you just don't know the other big question is what happens when the u.s leaves the u you know can, uh, you know the idea is to turn it all over to the afghans but the afghan army is getting much better but it's certainly not ready to run the show itself. That's a long answer, but, you know. Uh, yes? Uh. Hi, my question is, uh, sorry, my name is Michael Monroe and I'm studying economics. My question is about your role as a journalist covering conflict and potential conflict. It seems like there's potential for a little bit of a struggle, maybe even an ethical internal debate. You know, your responsibility to 
to your readers or to the paper is to cover and to, you know, to make this information exposed and to talk about what's really happening. But there's also maybe a concern that the more you talk about a conflict, or, or the example you give in China, the more attention you draw to a specific right. threat, it almost rewards those who are creating a threat. So I'm just wondering, as a journalist trying to cover conflict without creating more conflict, but trying right. to patch things up, how, how is that conversation internally? And, and what is that like when you and your fellow reporters are sitting there talking about, okay, you know, how do we cover this? How do we explain oh. what exactly what's going on without rewarding the party that might be trying to show a sign of strength or to build I up understand. a threat? I understand. Well, in this, I see Sorry. what you mean. But in this case, um, w w our concern is uh, just writing about what's happening, right? And this was a real conflict. I mean, I guess there were, there were different degrees of, of um, uh, the, s the stories that came out of the um, of the test flight in Japan and China, they were different. Um, uh, the Washington Post took a very very tough line and said this was absolutely an indication. This is the John Pomfret was the reporter. He's a terrific. He, he's a serious China scholar, you know. And uh, he's um, and he took a really tough line and said this was an absolute no equivocation. This was a really you know serious bold. Um, you know, uh, show of force by the Chinese military, partly because I'm not a China scholar, uh, scholar and partly because the New York Times is just by nature a little less, you know, uh, a little more cautious than something like that. You know, we said it, you know, it appeared to be an unusual show. You know, we had just a few words like that. Um, so, but I see, I'm trying to think of an example. The China one isn't a good example because that was such an obvious, um, you were never going to not report that. <laughs> it was just, you know, way, way. Uh, but I think, uh, in general, um, people always, I often get asked questions about, you know, journalistic bias. Um, you know, there, there's an assumption that we're all biased in one way or the other. And um, I think that, you know, you know, politically, you know, right or left, especially when you do political reporting, you get that question. But I think that our real bias is in just a bias toward conflict, maybe towards what you were asking about, that we, that's what makes news. So in some ways, we may sometimes you it, it's possible we might pay it, play up conflict just because it's, you know, it's a better story. But I don't think I ever have. I mean, I don't. I can't think of any example where I've done something where I thought, well, that wasn't really as bad as it, you know, as I said it was. In fact, to meander further down this road, um, I, um, my husband and I, he, so my husband used to cover the White House for the Times back when Reagan was president, and. Um, we always have this saying now in the family where as bad as you think it is in the White House, you know, about conflict that you're reporting, it turns out it's ten times worse, you know, because when the books all come out years later, it's like, oh, I was such a fool for, for like, being careful with the way I was writing that, you know. So <laughs> I guess, I don't know, that answers your question, but, yeah. Okay, who has, let's see, D yeah, y right here. Hey, AJ Swartwood, yeah, good yeah, to see yeah, you again. Yeah, yeah. Um, <coughs> In the spirit of journalism, I'm going to ask you a two-part right. question. Yeah. So, um, and one's based a little more internationally and one on journalism. But anyway, you wrote an article about Egyptian stability based on a divided government. And I guess I'm just wondering how, in the wake of this revolutionary spirit that's sweeping across the Middle East, what does it really mean to the United States? What does it mean to us? Is anything really different now, um, I guess, in terms of foreign policy and how will relate with these countries in the future. Right. So that's my first question. My second question is more journalistically motivated. Um, is there a future for print journalism? Like, <laughs> that's like, a uh, really good question, right? right? <laughs> They're kind of at a crossroads. Yeah. Like, yeah. Is, is the newspaper dead? From New York Times perspective, I just think it'd be interesting to get your thoughts yeah. on that. Yeah. Okay, the first question, um, well, you know, God knows if you can find somebody to explain to you what exactly is happening in all these countries simultaneously in the Middle East, good luck. You're not going to get it from me. But I think that that um, it, it's, you know, uh, there might be something in the Times tomorrow about somebody. But I, I, it's such a, it's, it changes by the hour. It changes by the country. I think that what the U.S. is interested in is, as always, stability. Um, you know, democracy, yes, but stability. So its main concern in Egypt was that there would be a, not the violence not you know go out of hand and that whatever government takes place t you know takes uh, ends up whatever the government ends up being that it's somehow a friendly government to the U.S. and that seems you know that seems to be where it was going um, and uh, so that that's the main also with Bahrain you know there's some concern that the Bahrain is the headquarters of the U.S. Navy's fifth fleet which is the which is the the naval th th those are the naval forces that are are basically in the central command in the in well you know in the area 
Uh, they include, you know, uh, that includes uh, the waters off of Pakistan and, you know, the Persian Gulf and Somalia. Those are those are pretty important waters. Now that's the there's a s base there and there's a small headquarters. But so you know we're interested in, again, our main concern is stability, and being able to have a relationship with whatever government emerges, as opposed to where we are now with Libya, which is no relationship and so forth, and Iran, right. Um, on, the, on, on journalism, um, on the future of newspapers, um, well, <laughs> you know, so far, w the Times is hanging in there, you know. I mean, I think that um, what, we, what people at the papers say is we, we actually don't care how you get your New York Times news anymore. You can have it in the newspaper if you want, which is very expensive, not for you guys, but when you grow up and <laughs> you know, go out in the real world, you will find that subscribing to the New York Times newspaper is extremely expensive. Seven, you know, but it's w well worth it. Um, uh, and uh, y right, 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 right. We pay for it at our, you know, my house. We pay for it. I'm always complaining about the cost of it. Um, the, uh, the, uh, but I think you'll get so, or you can get it. You know, we don't care how you get it. You, you can get it online. You can get it on your BlackBerry. You know, uh, you can watch our videos. Uh, we don't care as long as. You, you get it somehow. And in the last year, the Times, despite all the terrible news in the economy and how badly papers are doing, the Times had a, had a pretty good year last year. So there's not, the, nobody knows if this is going to continue. And, you know, we're about to start charging for the web. But it probably, it will not affect any of you here in, in, in the Times. It's going to be a very modest amount. It's going to be, um, it won't affect 95% of the readers of the website. It's just people, the only people it's aimed at are people who come to the web every day and use the Times website. It's, it's like it's like it's paper and read it very deeply, you know, so and it'll be a modest amount. So um, there's hope that that will not be, um, that that will not, not too many readers will fall off because of that and that, you know, it'll be a positive uh, income stream, so. Well, we don't care how you get, oh, right. Well, you're now going to be, right. But the idea is that, uh, well, you're going to pay something for the web. Somebody will pay something. So um, that's a good question. We don't, we don't care how, well, we do care a little bit. But basically, <laughs> we mostly, but honestly, we want you to read the paper. Yeah. The bottom line is we want you to read the paper, you know, and, and so, that's a big success right there, you know, so. Yeah, well, the website's been a big success. The website is one of the most successful media sites there is. I don't know if you go to it. It's, I think it's fantastic. It's got, you know, way more than the newspaper now in terms of video and just interactive stuff. And it's, they just, they just did, they've, the people who've done the website have really done a b terrific job. It really looks good. Yes, ba back in the corner there. Jim Jeffries, uh, faculty kind of. <laughs> uh, Korea, last time U.S. troops met Chinese troops in Chinese numbers, how they don't care about loss of life when right. they. Right. So, what's the question? You just where, where does Korea play in the Chinese U.S. military? Korea is extremely worried, uh, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, Korea has been caught in this whole, this whole, um, mess in the Pacific, Korea uh, is especially worried about North Korea. Uh, and in terms of the U.S. right now, the U.S. is, um, is frustrated with, chi with, with, uh, with China for not, for not being tougher on North Korea and trying to bring North Korea in line because China and, you know, is, is, is North Korea's most important ally. So there, that's, a, that's a difficult relationship. But I don't know, you're talking about a, to like a land war? Yeah. What, what is the U.S. military's concern about, about a land war with, with Chinese involvement in Korea? Uh, you know, some. I mean, considerable, but it's not. I don't know that. I can't. I actually don't know the right answer to that question. I don't know exactly what the military is concerned about in terms of Chinese involvement with Korea. They're more in concerned about North and South Korea right now and the tensions between those two countries and the extent to which China is not being a positive uh, force there. That answers your question. Um, let's see. Yes, you haven't answered, asked a question, right? No. Okay. My name is Benjamin Hayford. I'm an Asian studies major with a focus on China. 
Uh, this question is mostly about China, but it also relates to the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, my question is just, it seems like, um, for instance, we have this rise of China, or we've been at war in Afghanistan for 10 years, Iraq for seven or eight, depending on how you count. Right. And there just seems to be a general disconnect among the average American populace. Uh, what, are, what kind of a suggestion do you have, or kind of what is your personal, personal perspective on uh, bridging that gap, oh. on tuning in at the average American to what's going on overseas, both with the military conflicts and also with China and the rise there? I don't really know what the answer is. I do know it's an interesting question because I know that um, the Defense Department's very aware of it, and you probably know as well that um, that um, because it, it's an all-volunteer military, that it, it the it, it doesn't affect you know the the I mean Gates gave a very interesting speech about this about six months ago about how um, the military is increasingly disconnected from the nation it is sworn to protect because of an all-volunteer military it tends to be self-selecting. So a large proportion of the military comes from um, the South, from small towns, from rural areas. And as a result, that's where a lot of the recruiting efforts have gone because they produce more results if you go to the South. And, um, and also because there's a lot, a lot of uh, what's changing now, because the don't tell, but for, there, but for many years there have been very few ROTC programs on Ivy League you know, campuses and so forth. So it's, um, you know, is it, what was the line Gage used in the speech? He said that, um, you know, for a lot of them, for many, for most Americans, increasingly fighting our wars is something that other people do, you know. And so um, he, I don't know what the solutions are to that. I don't know. I don't know that Americans, um, I don't know what the answer is to get m Americans more focused on, on conflict abroad. I mean, nobody likes, you know, there's a lot of war fatigue right now. It, it, a decade of war in Afghanistan. There's a sense somehow that it's winding down, but you know, I think um, I don't know what the answer is. I'm just there. It's certainly a w we're aware of it, you know, and um, nobody wants to go to to, to conscrip conscription again to the draft. That's not us. Nobody at the Pentagon wants to do that because generally they're very pleased with the the, the professionalism of the of the military right now. So. Okay, uh, right here. Sorry, <laughs> yeah, you can go, and then I'll ask the answer your question if you want to come up over afterward. Afterwards. Hi, my name is Addison Jenkins. Um, I'm studying civil engineering, but I'm um, learning Chinese as well. Um, we hear a lot about different scenarios with China, whether they'll um, take over the U.S. economically or military within 10, 20, 30 years. Right. Um, my question for you is. What is your opinion, kind of, on the end game um, in in thirty years? I mean, if you where are they going to be? <laughs> are we are we going to see? I mean, I've heard talk of you know maybe they could they're they'll overheat and their economy will right. collapse. Will they surpass us? Will we get drawn into a conflict with some other third party? What's your kind of take on what? The I just don't are? know. There, there's all the scenarios are at the Pentagon. Um, I asked that very question to somebody who's um, who handles China policy at the Pentagon just a week ago. I said, "Well, what do you think?" He said, "Well, you know, he's they're worried that, you know, that this nationalism and you know uh, this rising nationalism could really they could become extremely you know extremely aggressive." Um, but on the other hand, um, you know, maybe not, and maybe that you know for already there was a story just a few days ago about how. Um, Chinese uh, exports are 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 cr because of their inflation that there there's a cooling in their exports and so there's b the beginnings of beginnings nobody knows if it's going to mean anything of maybe their economy is not going is not going to keep going gangbusters and so forth um, n I don't know I mean I'm the l I, I, you know y you could ask a, somebody who was uh, a China expert who knows far more than I do and you're going to get the same answer it's just hard to tell or there there certainly are very aggressive elements within the within the army, you know, who view the you know uh, who within the army. Not I'm not saying the entire army. Not who view the United States as a country in decline. Who talk about this openly, and are tired of you know feeling like they're being pushed around by the United States. There is that element, but I think that the civilian leadership. I don't think it's different, you know. And um, I just don't have a good answer. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you all very much.